So that's sort of the topic, and that's me and my um, email address. I actually spent a year and a half. Oh, sorry, let's switch this on so you can see. I spent a year and a half, um, roughly, on an ERP project at Rolls Royce uh, back in the back end of 1999, 2000, and I was responsible for the main infrastructure and SAP, and I owned the SAP basis team and. But I've got some sort of background there, and some of my uh, colleague, uh, students have also been implementing ERP in small businesses. So it's kind of there's some interesting background I've got, uh, which we'll kind of bring into the workshop in terms of some of the interesting questions about implementing ERP and the problems you might need to find ways around. I'm also doing quite a lot of work in the field of big data and analytics, and I'm leading the work we're doing to introduce a range of um, undergraduate and postgraduate programs in the field of big data, data science, analytics, looking at the question of the data skills gap that exists and is predicted to grow and grow and grow. Uh, <coughs> and I've also been involved in quite a lot of these sort of conferences in the retail space, in the telecom space, <coughs> manufacturing here, and particularly around the governance issues of how do we do big data analytics effectively? And this is what the presentation now is about. Now, we know that there is an enormous amount of data around us. We're getting more and more and more data. We're finding ways of getting more and more data up, upstream and downstream from all of our suppliers, all the way through us out to our, from our customers. And we see uh, companies like the car manufacturers with their smart cars uh, reporting back on how <coughs> we actually drive their cars rather than all the assumptions that in the past have been important. So there's an enormous amount of data. We know how our customers are using our machinery. So if you're a machine tool manufacturer, now you can start collecting staggering amounts of data about what they're really doing. You can find out in a predictive sort of sense, when the equipment might be coming, uh, coming up to a failure mode, and you can get in there quickly and get it serviced. So there's lots and lots of interesting stuff. I want to look at how do we use big data effectively. Very briefly, I want to bring in where 4.0 is coming from and where it might take us to. The point that big data is everywhere around us, all pervasive. And then people are saying big data is now the new lubricant of business. But I want to then think about, okay, so we've got all this data, but can we trust it? Because there's a big veracity problem about big data. In fact, there's a big veracity problem about all data that we have. We cannot necessarily trust it. And there are some interesting questions we have to think about as we try to use it. And then I'll have a look at a few thoughts about some governance imperatives, what we need to do, the questions we actually have to ask ourselves before we go do things. Because it's by asking these questions that we can determine what's actually going to happen for us individually. Because we're all from different organisations, or there are a lot of organisations here, and each organisation is different from every other organisation in all sorts of interesting ways. <coughs> and they are getting sensible answers based on your own knowledge of your own organization, the way it operates, its types of customers, its types of equipment it manufactures, or, and so on. And the culture within your organization are all different. And getting answers to how that's going to affect the implementation of all of those magical systems that are out there that can really help you if you do it right, but if you do it wrong, it will take your business out. In the late 1990s, a company up in Leicester very nearly took itself out because they thought they'd done the testing, and when they came to actually implement it, they couldn't actually get the recipes into their biscuit-making machinery. And they nearly went under. There are other examples of much bigger companies in the late 90s who did go under because they didn't ask the right questions, they didn't configure, test, and implement in the most effective way, they didn't solve the problems of culture. So the governance imperatives of big data and of ERP systems, of IT systems, are all essentially the same sets of questions. 
And if you don't answer them, you are going to have problems. I can guarantee that. We see so many case studies around the world that need to be thought about. And then I want to very briefly look at a small question which is growing very rapidly, is the question of big data analytics skill sets. The stuff we have to deliver to you as graduates and also <coughs> what you need to develop and improve and extend in your own existing workforce. So that's the sort of broad context I want to cover some of those points. We're getting staggering amounts of data. From the industry that I worked in, Rolls-Royce Aerospace, we're, oh, they are now collecting gigabytes of data per flight off aircraft. That's ex that record everything about how those engines hanging off the wings are actually operating. The um, avionics people are doing the same, the airframe people are doing the same. Staggering amounts of data. There are also, I, many of you have manufacturing equipment with lots and lots of sensors on. Are you using that effectively? How can you use it to make your business run more effectively, to reduce the levels of downtime, for example? Lots and lots of things happen there. Sensors I mentioned, and then of course you've got transmitters, the RFID, RFID type equipment and, and others, which can be used for helping you to track where all of your goods are coming from your suppliers, through the supply chain, and then out from you, all the way out to your end customers. So there's lots of ways of collecting data. And that's not thinking about um, all the social networks who are from collecting data from your customers, about their perceptions of your service, and so on and so forth. But then there's an interesting question about analytics. Analytics, by and large, is based almost entirely on statistical techniques. It's excellent for telling you what actually happened in the past. If you've got the right networks and so on, the right processing capabilities, it'll tell you pretty much what's going on now. The holy grail for many CEOs and COOs and CIOs and CXOs is what's going to happen in the future, the predictors. And this is where the governance questions I'm gonna lead you to become critically important. Because they help you to judge the time frame that your predictors are going to work on. CXOs tend to like the long term, three, five, 10, 15 years. At the operational level, you're looking at the next week, the next two weeks, the next four weeks, the next six weeks. You've got to judge how your data that you've got is capable of being extrapolated. And we had a wonderful example in the last <coughs> fortnight where the world has once again changed, <coughs> at least in Britain, the Brexit vote. All sorts of interesting things have changed. If you go back to 2008 in the financial services world, when the credit crunch happened, the economic models, which have been changing about every 10 years, but they break and are quickly rebuilt. The macroeconomic models have not yet been rebuilt since 2008. There are no effective economic models which tell governments and central banks <coughs> what is going to happen next week, next year, as a, if we try to increase or to wind down quantitative easing. No one has a clue. Something broke real big time. And so you then have to think about the future, your predictive analytics, is what are you trying to achieve And how stable is our data? And what is the likely breakage that's going to change the way our, our um, predictive algorithms are working? So lots of questions we need to think if we're going to jump on the bandwagon. Big data gives us incredible opportunities to understand what we're doing, what our customers are doing, and how our suppliers are operating. They can help the ERP, MRP side, inventory management, 
we understand better how products are being used. In some areas, we can see huge changes to our business models happening because we now know how our customers are using our equipment. We can use that now to provide a different business model. Instead of selling our things to our customers, we can lease it on a per widget manufactured basis. So then they are much happier because you don't have the million quid's worth of machines on their balance sheet. They've just got a revenue cost per widget they produce. And you come in and provide them with the support and maintenance to keep that machine running 24-7. Aerospace has been doing this for 30, 35 years, power by the hour. Almost all major engines sold this nowadays, the big aircraft, are not sold to the airline. They're leased to the airline on a pound of oh, price per cycle, price per flight hour, and people are monitoring that gigabyte of data per flight and say, ah, oh, I need to take it off wing and fix it. I can or send a maintenance engineer out at the end of the flight to fix something that's kind of going wrong. So fascinating new business models available to you all as well. So you, and I covered basically this bit here. Now, pro, da, big data project governance. These thoughts here are particularly related to big data and big data analytics. But the hype at the top is another question that applies to all IT related things, including ERP systems. With big data analytics, there are relatively there are a few incredibly highly successful and highly visible projects, and these are the ones where people say, "Oh yes, I've done my uh, big data analytics on social media, and because I've done this, this, and this, I can now increase my sales revenue by X percent, or my profit margins by such and such, or my, and so on." And there are some very, very good examples. Problem is. There is the Gartner height curve. And if you, anybody's looked at the Gartner height curve, it's quite interesting to see how things become incredibly, incredibly wonderful as you start up in the first year or three of a technology. And then it goes down into the slough of despondence. Eventually, after reality has filtered all the different ideas, you have a few that go into the effective and successful production. You also need to think about the fact that only 30% roughly of all IT-related projects are truly successful in terms of on time to budget and meeting the business objectives and delivering the business uh, benefits. In terms of gaining insights from data, which is what we're looking at big data for, BI and big data, how do we get insights? First of all, if you have enough data, you are always going to get some sets of data correlating with each other. But we have to remember, correlation is not the same as causation. The other thing that comes from a rather interesting book by a guy called Gary Klein, who is a book's all about <coughs> seeing things that others don't see, in the corporate context, there is a lot of lip service given to the idea we're looking for insights. The question then is to look at the real culture inside the organization and find out whether the organization really wants that disruptive effect of insights. Because management as a sort of practice wants stability, repeatability, and so on and so forth, so that we can plan effectively. Things happen the same way every time. The same types of decisions are made in the same sort of way. But if we start getting insights, we can kind of disrupt that quite badly. And so we need to think very, very carefully as to whether our systems, our processes, um, and our culture hinder the way that we really can get benefit from big data and our analytics. And the last little point in terms of accuracy of data is a rather weird problem that came uh, identified by John Easton. I'm going to show a few little pictures to sort of kind of reinforce all of these points. 
80% of all of the data around us is of uncertain veracity. Not that it is all wrong, but we have a problem of identifying which is the data that is actually accurate, which of the data is wrong or not accurate, and by how much it's inaccurate. And I've been doing some work with my students at uh, Derby in terms of location services accuracy on our smart devices. And this has interesting impacts, for example, for retailers who are trying to do um, location-based advertising to your smart device. It doesn't matter if, it's only if, if your location is 25 meters from where you know you are. <coughs> but if your phone is reporting you 50, 60, 70, 80 miles from where you are, that's kind of a problem. You're getting yourself into possible reputational damage problems. Because I do not wish to have an advert saying you're now outside the Starbucks in, Luff in Derby just here, and you know that you're in Sheffield. This is not a helpful thing. Uh, as an example. <coughs> so, it, and the problem is, we cannot work out very easily from a single reading from your smartphone whether your smartphone is, is correctly identifying where you are. And there's a company out in the States that's done a lot of research on billions and billions and billions of location-based adverts, and something like 11% of all of the adverts they've looked at are more than 60 miles in location error. And I've got data which shows you know, about 5 10% just based on testing. And they've got this other stuff. So we have problems with accuracy of data. And again, with your sensors, maybe on your equipment, sensor drift, calibration drift. How do you detect when the calibration has changed? If you're doing, I was talking to one of my colleagues, and if you're doing um, atmospherics or pollution checking, there's a couple of types of sensor, one which is very accurate for a couple of months, uh, and one that starts drifting within minutes or days of you installing it. How do you detect the drift and correct for it? How do you detect the drift on some of the sensors on your machine tools? And so on. Ah, we've got the wrong one. It is broken again. Um, the presentation, I've, I'll be putting a copy of the presentation up again on my website, and this shows, um, these are the failed ones here, and unfortunately the second set have got messed up uh, in the conversion to PDF, sadly, I think. Um, so it doesn't show the picture quite as well, but what it shows, the intent here is that 30%, 35% of projects are... Um, Within, you know, are meeting the success criteria that I mentioned before. Something like 35, 40% are what Standish Group call challenged, late over budget, and delivering some of the functionality, some of the benefit, and something like 30% just fail completely. And that's been consistent since they started ca ca capturing this chaos data in 1994, and they do surveys every year. So it shows a picture that IT-related projects are of particular difficulty to actually get right. And we've seen it lots and lots of times. In terms of veracity, this is the John Easton um, chart. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, the enterprise data, you know, the stuff inside SAP or whatever, that we can trust at all times. And as some of the guys who are selling, or the suppliers out there, are going to say, one of the things you do when you implement is you clean your data carefully. And most companies throw away something like 60% of the master data and other data um, in their old legacy systems, import that 30%, <coughs> and bingo, we're happy. It turns out, in actual fact, that within five years, you have a data cleanliness problem within your ERP data. I know a very, very large organization who, I think it was seven years later, um, had to do a massive data cleansing exercise, and it took them, they started some years ago, and they ran for three or four years to try and identify the erroneous data and clean it up. So even that lot there isn't very clean. 
One of the reasons is partly, and we'll touch on it in the workshop later on, is the fact that ERP systems are constructed and implemented in a way that reduces the functionality compared to what you are actually used to using pre-ERP. But the world doesn't check, won't sort of stop and say, I don't need that functionality any longer. Your customers, whether internal to your process or external, as real live world customers, will still have needs which now no longer can be shoehorned, easily shoehorned into the direct functionality. So you, <clears throat> but your, your staff, because they want to ensure that the customer is satisfied, will find ways of easing the data, the transaction into the system in some fashion. Once that happens, with special codes or whatever, you start losing track of what the data really means. Your management data becomes very interesting, because you've got to remember that there's this code which means, and separate that little bit out before you do your management reporting. So all of this, and this is the stuff we're really interested with ERP, becomes interestingly uh, lacking in veracity really quite rapidly. If you happen to be looking out at people's perceptions and people's ideas, here's a little chart from um, YouGov, a survey a year or so back, asking people about various things. And this one said, if you get theoretical sort of questions about what you might or might not do in the future, <coughs> it shows 50% say no. Only about half the sorry, 50% um, of the time, um, I will, will be accurate. 19% are saying I'm only really predicting properly what I do 50% of the time. We lie. Social media is full of lies, or else it's full of adverse comments. You, know, you go to a restaurant. If you have the service you expect, will you tweet? If you have bad experience, you might tweet. It's about 10 to 1, roughly. Analytics, correlation. Here's a beautiful example. Import it in the direct correlation. I mean, look at that R squared factor. That's a correlation coefficient. 0.97. That means nearly perfect correlation between the um, number of tons of lemons imported from USA, uh, to USA from Mexico correlated with car uh, deaths on the roads in the USA. Perfect correlation and clearly absolutely <coughs> no useful causality. Think what your, stuff, your data is correlate doing. You're, because your analytics and big data are statistical correlation by and large. They'll find that if that happens to be in your data set. So out of all of this, some questions, governance, how do we do know that we're doing the right thing in the right way to the <coughs> quality in the right, and you can add as many right things as you want? And it seems to us, the work that we've been doing in terms of theoretical, admittedly, but that we haven't gone out to you guys to get you to verify that this really works, but it seems that these sort of questions, which are related to the... Um, kind of the UK <coughs> approach to governance, both corporate governance, security governance, in ISO 27000 series. We pose ourselves questions, because we are all different. And we've come up with 12 different words, all beginning with V, that started off with the first three definitional Vs for big data, volume, uh, variety, and velocity. And then we picked up the value one from IBM, and we've extended out to 12, and I'll show you the list in a minute. Because they will help you understand what you are trying to do, and the nature of the system, to the processes, even the culture, in some respects. They also help you to understand the nature of the types of data you're acquiring. And those two links there will help you find uh, a bit more information about these 12 Vs. The second government's imperative is to use the Standish Group uh, chaos reports for, in 
insights as to what helps <coughs> IT-related projects to be successful. Things like executive support, all the way down to culture, and so on. And then, one of the things that they have said many, many times over the years is that you plan as best you can, and then you add 40% contingency to everything in sight. Now, this goes completely against CIO and CXO um, values, which are you plan, and then you cut it by 10 to 20 to 30%. And then you have what we call a challenging uh, scenario. And we all know what happens with challenging scenarios. We all fail. We cannot do it that way around. The standards groups say the only successful projects nowadays are the ones where they've added 40% contingency to cost, time scale, and money. And then if you project and program manage it like crazy, you might be one of those 30% of successful projects. If you do do the, oh, we'll go with that budget, or no, 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 we can't afford it, we'll go with 30% uh, 30 reduction on the budget, it will not work. It will guarantee to be either one of those 40% challenge or one of those 30% catastrophes. And then Daniel Kahneman, in his book, Thinking Sl Fast and Slow, talks about the planning fallacy. We're going to be successful this time. Do you know why you failed last time? Do you know why you were successful last time? Because if you don't know either of those, it's just random. We are all optimists in this respect. Our project is going to be successful. We just had to listen to that interview with Blair, uh, Tony Blair this morning. To hear something related to this. And just to, finally, to wrap up, the Vs, volume, velocity, variety. So looking at things like the size of the data, the amount of the data, how fast it's hitting you, um, the variety. In the past, it was easy, it was all structured. Nice databases. Now we're getting unstructured, we're getting all sorts of stuff flowing through from our sensors um, in rapid, different timing intervals and so on. We're getting a lot of free text around us. But the newer Vs are things like variability. So that's a sensor drift example, for example, perhaps. We need to think very carefully about our systems and our ERP, all of our big data. Who is it of value to? Is it of value to us? Is it of value to our customers? And what are we measuring value by? Is value pound notes and there's an interesting example comes up, I think it is, in one of these slides later on today, um, which looks at, do we really have to cost justify everything? You know, the new carpet outside in the, by reception? Or not? Something like 20 years ago now, I and some other colleagues in the commercial part of uh, Rolls-Royce Aerospace won the argument that we did not have to justify Two and a half thousand pounds per person to put a PC on their desk. We changed the argument to tool of trade. And so we just flooded the entire organization with PCs. How can you, justi how can you cost justify having one PC on that desk over there for the three graduate apprentices who come through on a three monthly cycle? There's no cost payback you can come up with. So you have to think very carefully what value is all about. <coughs> now, if you think about your smartphones, what's the, why do we make the choice between, say, Android and iOS, Apple versus all the others? What's the value to me of having one as opposed to the other as a customer? Usability, ease of use, I feel comfortable with it. That's useful value sometimes. We talked about veracity, the truth of the data. Um, how do we, is it valid? Is it, is it applied? Does it relate to what we're trying to do? The volatility one is particularly related to social media. We change our opinion. So if you do a snapshot of 
social uh, sentiment analysis on social media. We know that's valid-ish for the time that those tweets or Facebook or whatever was pu published, possibly, as long as we can also detect at that same time irony, which is difficult. But will I change my mind at some time in the future? So how long, if I'm making decisions on that sentiment, sentiment analysis, do I dare use that data as something, predicting something <coughs> into the future? How quickly does that data go stale, ultimately? Verbosity, text, because if you're using text analysis, it's kind of interesting. If you're using Twitter analysis, it becomes even more <coughs> exciting because we don't even use <coughs> proper grammar, syntax, proper spelling even. We use irony, which humans can detect, but machines find incredibly difficult to detect. Vulnerabilities, all sorts of things. It could be pure security issues, and we see a lot of <coughs> problems like that. Um, but it could also be reputational vul vulnerability. You know, sending that, that um, location-based advert when you are 60, 100, 500 miles away from where you really are. Think about the damage the target did to themselves, but with their, both with their analytics, where they were able to predict the date of birth of, um, within a month at least, of their female customers, and then targeted them with adverts, and they used it rather inappropriately, I would suggest, and caused themselves huge reputational damage. How do we verify the data? Can we trust our data? And that kind of links back to veracity. And the final V is visualization. Now, we've learnt, known, many of us, over most of our career, that you can draw graphs in interesting ways that hide the inconvenient data or can overemphasize what's not really very good, but actually makes it look good. And if you use log scales, you can show everything's looking very, very hunky-dory. And the government got into trouble about two years ago for showing infrastructure. Uh, investments that looked all very nice and neat and sim similar, except that one of them, which was flood defence investment, was actually only about that much when you put a proper standard linear scale. So visualisations are another area you need to think about very, very carefully in terms of your reporting and who is going to create those, and that leads to the skill sets of the um, visualizers and the storytellers in your analytics team. So, lots of questions here. And if you can ask, ask those questions with an open mind, <coughs> you will understand a lot about your organization and a lot about how to make your projects successful. Three books that I think you'll find very, very interesting. The middle one by Nicholas Carr uh, looks <coughs> at the impact of uh, automation and electronic automation, decision making uh, on both people, how we think, how we behave, and the workforce. Thinking fast and slow <coughs> is a very interesting one about how we really think, how people make decisions, and we're not actually as rational as we like to think. And seeing what others don't, the remarkable, what, remarkable ways we gain insight by Gary Klein is all about what is this word insight all about? How does it relate to what we're doing in business? How does it relate to what we want to use big data analytics for? And there are the various details about the sources. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. Um, has anyone got any questions very quickly for Richard? Um, if you, if, you, if you do have something you want to run past Richard later, uh, he will be staying, as I said uh, earlier, for the, uh, oh, well, as Richard touched on, for the workshop and the Q&A panel. So, and then he'll be, uh, what's the best kind of word, milling uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, so if you do want to come and uh, have a chat with him, please, please do, uh, and he can do the day. Thanks. <coughs> Great start. Um, up next, we've got uh, Matt, Matt Boyle, uh, who's IT manager for Baker Perkins. Um, and he's going to be talking about preparing or preparation for an ERP 